All right, so here's the plan. We're gonna go to Causeway Bay and check out some watches. Some really cool watches. Let's go. So we're now here at Causeway Bay, a part of Hong Kong Island. We're surely going to make our way over to a watch dealership in Causeway Bay, namely Ken's Watches. Uh, viewers of the channel will find that funny. So the purpose of this video is to give you a sense of what a retail watch store in Hong Kong is like, the kind of stock they have, and a general sense of the ubiquity of watches, particularly luxury watches here in Hong Kong. We'll take a look at a couple of watches and try them on so you get the general idea of what the overall experience is like. Now it might be a little bit odd to see this many watches displayed so closely together in a store that's rather small, but this is quite normal for Hong Kong. This is how it is because rents are sky high and uh, there's a huge demand for luxury products. So most luxury stores are small and have a lot of stock and plenty of things. So the focus is the watches, not so much the, the retail space. I kind of actually really appreciate this aspect of it because when you have more of an experience or a store where you're supposed to come and spend time, sit down, drink something, there you're more likely to feel the pressure of sales, um, someone delivering a sales pitch or trying hard to sell you on something. Whereas here it's far more casual, you just pop in, see what you want, try on a couple of things. Not many questions asked and you can just go on with your day. I've noticed this hands-off sales approach to exist purely because of the number of watches that do sell in Hong Kong every day, particularly for the size of Hong Kong. So there's a lot of volume being traded anyway, so there isn't too much pressure on sales staff to actually get a sale out of every customer that walks in the door. And it's, it's nicer for the customer this way, um, but also for those of you who are looking for the experience of buying a watch. I guess you'd leave that to the ADs. So what kind of stock should you expect to see at a Hong Kong watch dealer? Well, plenty of Rolex, some Panerai, actually quite a lot of Panerai. Hong Kong has this fascination with Panerai. Panerai seems to have captured the hearts of many watch enthusiasts here in Hong Kong. They're actually perhaps equally as common as Rolex here. There used to be a huge Panerai craze through the 2000s and they've only slightly cooled off in the last five years or so. I'd say Panerai is more commonplace than even Omega and Tudor, but AP is also commonplace and so is Patek. These are the few juggernauts and there's a lot of other eclectic watches, occasionally some Grand Seiko, some Breitlings here and there. There's also a dash of Tudor here and there, although not too popular. Something interesting that I noticed is that watches are not treated too differently depending on how much the value of the watch is. So expensive watches or solid gold watches are not put on a pedestal. They're equally accessible, just placed amongst each other. Like you can see some of these solid gold Daytonas right next to the regular GMTs and steel. What really matters is whether the watch is brand new. In that case, then it's really wrapped and uh, you gotta be a lot more careful with it to not get any micro scratches. So essentially, if you want to try on a piece, it doesn't really matter how expensive it is. There's no hesitation behind that. It's just that if it's brand new, then you'd really have to be very pedantic and careful with it. Okay, so now let's get hands on with some of these watches. I'll pick a few of them. I don't want to go through every single watch. That would be a boring video. Now I've only picked Rolex and Patek because I think you guys are most interested in those pieces, at least from my previous videos, and I like them too. Starting off with the 41mm Tiffany dialed OP, which is now stupidly expensive and rare. I don't get the hype, um, Rolex clearly wanted to feed this hype, so they asked for it, they've got it. I don't understand why, because this is supposed to be an entry level Rolex, but well, I guess not. I do like the regular OPs though, because they updated the movement and made it on par with the sub, kind of. So that's good, but just not this. Next on to something way more impressive, a solid gold GMT Master 2. Now this is pretty cool. It's yellow gold and it's super heavy and it's super cool. It's just unmistakable on the wrist. 
And if you like that, well, this is the watch for you. In general, I think these are good value, especially when you look at something like the 41 Tiffany OP. Now, if that was a bit too flashy, you've got this, a two-tone root beer. Very nice. I'm not sure I care for two-tone all that much. I do understand why this is kind of nice and definitely in comparison to the Pepsi and Batman, there's more value here. Going back to basics, here's a watch that pretty much everyone could wear. The Datejust. Maybe not the 41, but some version of the Datejust. It is quintessentially Rolex. I think more than the Sub, more than the GMTs. If you're gonna have only one watch or even just one Rolex, then this is definitely the one. And that applies for non-watch enthusiasts all the same. It's just basic and great. Now, if you like the date just and it's too basic, this is quite a step above. And it's very cool, the Sky Dweller with a very similarly blue dial and a similarly fluted white gold bezel that no one will really actually learn how to use because everyone wants the most complicated watch to not be used, of course. When you get a Sky Dweller, you never actually use the Sky Dweller. You simply tell people around you how it's the most complicated movement that Rolex makes and what it can do, but you don't know how to do it. All in all, a very cool hyper date just. Next up is a more eclectic watch, the Explorer 2, but the previous reference to 15670. Same as the black one, white and black, two different options. Now this is for people who don't want the, the regular boring stuff, the common stuff. Now this is not super eclectic by any means, but it's just got more flair than you'd expect from Rolex. Now let's jump into something which is in an upper echelon of watchmaking, or so people say. So this is, well actually it's an entry level Patek. This is the Aquanaut. Amazing on the wrist. Simply amazing. I really like it on the strap. I think the bracelet that it comes with, if you choose to spec it so, is absolutely horrendous. So do get it on the supple rubber strap. It's a nice watch. Really basic, um, especially for the money it goes. But still, it's pretty cool. Now this is the 5712 and this is hot horology. It's my favorite watch here. If you'd ask me, which is the one Patek to get? Well, it's going to be the 5712. I like it more than the 5726, the 5711, of course, the 5980, and the 5990, and most of the Aquanaut range, the 5164, 67. It's aesthetically so beautiful, even though the dial is asymmetric, and I love it. This is a 5230 Platinum World Timer. Not really my cup of tea. It has an interesting dial design and the case is more classically shaped. It's not that Genta design. So let me know what you think of this piece. Now the last Patek is what people would call a heavy hitter, simply because it's solid rose gold, the case and construction. This one is not on the solid rose gold bracelet, which would have been most of the weight had it been on that. But this is the 5980 1R, I think. So not really my cup of tea. I do not like the leather straps at all. It's also a very expensive piece, hence the nickname. But yeah, let me know if you like this. Even the dial, the, that shade of brown, that's not something I'm a fan of. I much prefer the basic steel 5980, if you can call any of these things basic. Here in Hong Kong, in general, there's an avid interest in most luxury products, as this form of materialism is quite rooted in the culture. Naturally, that's uh, something most people would have opinions on, but to me, it's just fascinating to be able to handle all these cool watches. Purely speaking, from an enthusiast's perspective, you get to go and try on watches with, uh, sometimes with houses. It's just such a casual experience that it's uh, quite absurd, but so exciting at the same time. And that is something uh, you don't find everywhere. One of the cool aspects, at least one of the cool ways of thinking about it. And so that is what it's like to go to a watch dealer in Hong Kong. See ya.